I'm here on behalf of PAVE. I'm Julianne Peterson, coming from Novo Nordisk, remembering to stay close to the mic. Just a bit about PAVE. PAVE is a group. It's a forum for increased collaboration and understanding in the Alzheimer's disease ecosystem within Europe. As part of PAVE, we have regulators, we have payers, clinical experts, patient advocacy groups, and industry members. There are two big goals of PAVE. One is to educate policymakers and payers, other key influencers in Europe, on the challenges in Alzheimer's disease. And the other big goal is to work and collaborate together, of course, with these key stakeholders um, to develop solutions related to value assessments of future Alzheimer's disease therapies and diagnostics. Right, so a bit about payers and health technology assessment, also known as value assessments. So once the pharmaceutical industry have developed their products and completed the clinical trials, they will submit for regulatory approval. So regulators will then assess the efficacy of the drug, they'll look at the safety, so does it work? Is it safe for people to take? What was the overall quality of the clinical trials? And once they then approve, payers will have a look through these health technology assessments sometimes to see, okay, great, it works and it's safe. Regulators, regulators said yes, but is it better than what's already there? Does it give me any value for my money versus how things are currently handled? Because how does it impact my budget? So the purpose, overall purpose of a health technology assessment is to inform the payers about should this, should it not be used? how to use it, and traditionally in other uh, in therapy areas, you would have patients cycle through medication already on the market, the more the cheap generic, before getting to the innovative products. And which patients benefit the most? Should everybody get this? Are there people who would have a larger unmet need who should be prioritized, or how will this? How many, for how long? Because essentially, how does it impact their budget? They will do use a different mix of approaches and will look at the clinical efficacy primarily, the clinical effectiveness, what's the added clinical value. Others will rely more on the cost effectiveness. Do I get more health for the money? And essentially, again, like I said, the budget. How does it impact my budget? They all have the same budget, so if they say yes to something, they have to say no to something else potentially. However, usually, this only takes into consideration things that are paid out of their budget. So healthcare resource use, medication to patients, so direct cost for them. However, a study by Weimodel, the jury study, this was presented at AIC last year through a systematic literature review. Here we see that the economic impact of Alzheimer's disease increases across disease stages, which was the same across France, Germany, and the UK. What's currently not considered by most payers is the informal cost, meaning the cost and the economic burden on care partners. And right now in Alzheimer's disease, most the key driver of the economic cost is actually based on care partners. However, as said, currently not captured and probably also often overlooked. So with that, I will start the discussion. I will pose questions to our panelists. I will move away from here to better look at my panelists. And then please, while I uh, ask one of your questions, for the rest of you, please chip in in case you have anything you would like to add. Right. Does, does this one work? Yeah, it does. Um, OK, so Angela. What are patient reported outcomes captured? How, sorry, how are patient reported outcomes captured in current assessment frameworks? That works. Um, hi, everyone. So, I guess the first thing I might do is just say what patient reported outcomes are. are. So, um, a patient reported outcome is something that tells us about a patient's experience of disease or of treatment. Um, and Commonly, as you mentioned in your slide, a lot of uh, HTA primarily consider clinical outcomes. They also look at cost efficacy using health economic evaluations. 
Um, and there was some recent research looking at what parameters are considered by HTA. So I can think of one particular study, and I think they looked at three different countries in Europe. They looked at the UK, um, formerly in Europe, um, the Netherlands, and um, Spain, I think. No, Sweden, sorry, my apologies. And what they found is that different HTA agencies look in different ways at patient-reported outcomes. So of the three, um, NICE maybe had more consideration of patient-reported outcomes than some of the other um, health technology assessment agencies, which did focus quite a lot more on clinical benefits and, to a certain extent, the caregiver reported measures of burden. So I think there's an acknowledgement of some of the challenges that you mentioned there around the cost of informal care to caregivers. What isn't captured enough is the cost, um, I would get, uh, burden is not the best word that I like to use, but the burden of disease on patients themselves and their own experiences of disease. And um, so I guess the immediate answer is, at the moment, it's not, PROs are not uh, captured enough in most uh, value assessments. I think what we would like to see is more consideration of outcomes that are meaningful to patients, that make a difference to their lives, that also then maybe have an impact on, for example, adherence to clinical therapies, and will therefore maybe reinforce the value of treatment with a medication. Um, I might actually look at Marco here, who, in his role at Alzheimer's Nederland, might have something to say from the patient perspective. Maybe I come a bit from a different angle, because um, in the Netherlands we have an HGA uh, effectiveness that is really relying very much on budget. So costs are very important in their um, um, weighting, their, uh, the, the, yeah, balancing the, the yes or no against this kind of uh, implementation. So um, my first thing would be that don't over exaggerate the number of patients that will really come forward to use this kind of drugs. Um, in, in, uh, I, I worked for more than 26 years in the Alzheimer's Nederland office and we had this excellent debate and everybody was thinking that the numbers of people who were using these drugs were very high and in, in fact it was very low. But the, the uh, administration um, calculates with these big numbers. And then they say, well, that costs us too much uh, uh, money to implement it in healthcare. So I would be very uh, precise and not too over-optimistic about the number of people that use uh, these, these potential drugs if they come to the market. And the other thing is that please weigh also effectiveness versus side effects. Because in our opinion, a lot of people are positive um, optimistic about the effect of these drugs, but another great group of people are very negative and more pessimistic about the drugs. So they focus on the side effects of the drugs instead of the possible uh, potential effects. So don't think that all the patients are the same uh, and don't ex over exaggerate the number of people that probably will be uh, able to be treated with it. So. Before I allow the two of you to comment. I'm just going to loop back a bit and then we're going to the clinical um, assessment. But Angela, you mentioned meaningful outcomes. So what outcomes are most meaningful to patient and carers and how could this better be reflected in the value assessments to capture their experiences and perspectives? Yeah, thanks, Julie. That's a really good question. And I mean, I'm going to caveat this that by saying that what is meaningful one meaningful for one patient or one person with dementia will not be necessarily meaningful for the next person with dementia who might be receiving, or Alzheimer's disease, who might be receiving treatments. That being said, I can refer to uh, a project that Alzheimer Europe partnered in um, four or five years ago called Roadmap. And in that project, we did public involvement consultations with the European Working Group of People with Dementia, asking them um, what would make a meaningful difference to their lives, what outcomes they would prioritise if they had a choice and if they were to go to HTA and say, well, this is something that is of value to me. Um, and in a nutshell, they wanted um, a greater chance at more good years of life. And more years of life 
is to a certain extent captured in value assessment frameworks. When you look at qualies, for example, you're looking at those life years. But what was really important to them was the word good. Uh, and what makes a year of life or what makes a day of life good? So what are the outcomes that they really valued? Um, and they were things like being able to spend time with their friends and family. And, and these things, as you can probably imagine, are really difficult to capture unless you speak to the patients themselves. You know, they may not come up in, uh, in, in other assessment processes and, and are often not reported um, as outcomes. So um, based on those interactions, based on their feedback, um, I would say that quality, but quality in terms of meaningful aspects of their lives is what really jumped out. And then maybe just one final point, because as part of that uh, project, something that was quite interesting was that um, they spoke to carers and they spoke to healthcare professionals. And they were looking at whether there was a substantial overlap in the outcomes that were prioritised by those different groups. And something that really struck me and is very important to emphasise when we're thinking about HTA for novel drugs is that Different stakeholders have different perspectives, very different perspectives in some cases. So, for example, um, patients, people with dementia, valued having better orientation skills. They didn't care so much, and, and caregivers didn't really care as much about that, whereas caregivers really valued or, or were really impacted by being asked questions a number of times, repeated questions, whereas conversely, people with dementia in the working group said, well, that's not really something that I would value, having a treatment that affects that outcome. Uh, and healthcare professionals, very interestingly, there was some overlap, but maybe unsurprisingly, their value judgments fell very much within more, maybe more traditional domains of cognition and function. So I think really what I would emphasize there is um, meaningfulness is important, but involve people affected by the diseases that you're trying to treat to really get a handle on what meaningfulness is. And now I've realized we just did a rehearsal. I was in full on panel mode. I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please spend one minute each introducing yourselves? Okay. <laughs> I, I did my best a bit. Um, I'm scientific <laughs> director of Alzheimer Nederland. I'm also board member of uh, Alzheimer Europe. Um, yeah. uh, I'm Angie Bradshaw. I'm a project officer at Alzheimer Europe. Um, and my background is political sciences, but I'm a health economist. I've been in this field for many, many years, and my main occupation nowadays is um, lecturing on the topic. Thank you. So I'm not Michael Hapish, uh, who has COVID, and so I'm uh, backfilling him. I'm Stéphane Epelbaum uh, from Lilly Medical Affairs, and I have a background in neurology uh, from 15 years before joining Lilly. Perfect. Yes, my name is Annie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Right, so just final question, and then Stefan, Michael, I will ask you um, on the next. But just, okay, so brief final Angela or Angie or the rest of you. So briefly, very short, can you elaborate on the potential benefit of adopting a, the holistic approach versus the more traditional approach for these value assessments? What does it give? Well, I mean, I, th I think you actually provided most of the answer in your presentation. So you spoke there about quantifying direct benefits and the traditional approach quantifies direct benefits to a certain extent, where it focus very much, focuses very much on those direct benefits. Um, what isn't captured currently are those indirect benefits, those things that actually make a difference in people's lives, the things that make a difference at a societal level as well. So it's very difficult to put a number on societal benefit because there are so many different dimensions to societal benefit. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. So if you work towards a more holistic model of value assessment, I think you can get more meaningful measures of value to individuals, to healthcare professionals, to healthcare systems, but also to society in general. And I think really that's what we should start working towards, especially as around the corner, we have these new drugs, which do offer hope to people with Alzheimer's disease, but they also offer substantial cost to healthcare um, healthcare systems and they're not the only solution so what we need to consider really is reflect on how we can implement these new therapies and in 
to do that, we really need to understand the value and the meaningfulness of those therapies to patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, and society. Otherwise, it's going to make our, our lives, I say our lives, your lives, regulators' lives, society's lives, a lot harder. Okay, thank you. Anything to add? Yeah, maybe just stress the point you made that we should incorporate the costs for the informal caregivers into our um, uh, way of looking to the, uh, yeah, the cost effectiveness of these kinds of uh, drugs. Because uh, as long as people who care for are helped and less burned, it makes a lot of a difference in, uh, on a societal cost basis. So, and that's quite different in the dementia research and in other research, I think. I think that um, it's partly included in principle in the frameworks that HTA uh, organizations uh, have, have chosen. Uh, but the point is that in quite a few cases, uh, they are not satisfied with what is produced uh, in clinical trials. Uh, and there probably uh, there is much, still much more work to do to convince uh, HTA bodies, because you mentioned, uh, I mean, what, what your, your analysis you refer to is, is quite right, but uh, if you think in Germany, in principle, in principle, it's a legal requirement to consider quality of life impact uh, on, on a new treatment versus uh, usual treatment. Um, and they do look at it, but in many cases they are not satisfied with it. And it's about the same story in, in, in my country, in France. So, um, and probably to widen the perspective. Uh, relating, relating to caregivers, uh, yes, in, in some HDAs do consider in principle again uh, the quality of life on caregivers, uh, but they, first it's very, comp it's, it's not easy to, to collect, and when you collect it into a framework of a clinical trial, it might not be, you know, it might be biased because it's an experimental setting and so on and so forth. So I think there is a, a lot to do to, to, to improve that. Uh, because as we were discussing earlier on, I mean, um, they need hard data. And this is where the patients, uh, advocacy groups have a lot to do to first to have the, the tools, but then they can have researchers and they do that, work, working on it. Um, but to, to convince um, uh, patients and caregivers to, to participate to collection of data in a really uh, effective way. I think this is one of the key uh, issues you're bumping against. So I, I agree with uh, everything that has been said uh, in the panel so far, but just let me take a step back for one second and to see how things are done, you know, in, in clinical trials and um, to get to the point of registration of the drug. To get to the point of registration, you have to convince, like you said, of uh, benefit versus risk and a positive ratio of benefit versus risk. And to do that, usually regulators will ask you to look into, to, to use well-validated tools. Those well-validated tools are usually in Alzheimer's disease, for instance, scales, so questionnaires, tests that have been used in the past for many, many years, right? And we know reasonably well how these scales will evolve over time in Alzheimer's disease. And so this is going to be convincing to regulators. Uh, these tests should be inherently meaningful also to patients and other stakeholders. But probably, uh, since these are older scales, these are not ultimately uh, what, is, what, what the patients or their family would consider as most significant, most clinically meaningful for them. But then again, uh, when a phase three uh, trial uh, is successful, this is not the end of the development of a drug. This is uh, uh, a very important milestone, but this has to continue. And this is when uh, I think it is important when implementing in clinical practice to consider everything that you've mentioned, uh, meaning uh, patient reported outcome, involving um, patient and their family much more in the process, um, and 
in Alzheimer's disease, this is going to be challenging. I mean, no doubt about that, because no, not so long ago, a Delphi consensus article was published showing which scales are used, you know, in the field. More than 60 tools were mentioned in this article. Maybe you know uh, the one I'm talking about. This is impossible, you know, uh, for uh, moving forward in this field. So I'm quite encouraged by the fact that a, a small, reasonably, um, well, medium-sized, rather, group of uh, academic industry uh, patient advocacy group, Jean-Georges was there, and, um, and, and um, Gates Venture, also a venture group was there, uh, met at AIC in July to start a project to try and ha redefine care, if you will, to take into account all of that and have an approach with a minimal core data set that would be meaningful to all stakeholders, not only some academics or the industry or regulators, but all stakeholders, front and center, obviously patients uh, and, and their loved ones. Um, thanks, Stefan. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I maybe like to prod you as our industry representative on this panel. So you mentioned clinical trials there. And um, the design of clinical trials is fairly fixed, oh, well, fairly fixed, it's very fixed. You know, you, 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 you design your clinical trials many, many months, even years before they initiate. They have very fixed protocols, very fixed inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, and very fixed primary and secondary outcomes. Now, when you look at a lot of uh, cohorts and a lot of clinical trials, the inclusion of patient reported outcomes isn't hugely high, and, and I certainly understand the challenge because a lot of the scales are quite complicated to administer. They're very timely, are timely, time-consuming, and actually they're not that much fun to complete either from the patient perspective. Um, and when you spoke about consensus and maybe harmonising some of the assessments, or at least getting an agreed list of assessments that could be rolled out across trial platforms, I, I think that sounds like a very sensible plan. What do you see as the next steps in that type of um, process and what role do you see for industry in driving or supporting that? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Angela. Very good questions. So I, I think, you know, um, this is not like we are uh, reinventing the wheel here. This is something that has happened in the past. Uh, for instance, in the space of multiple sclerosis, you know, with uh, uh, new treatments already 20 years in the past. And so uh, this is exactly how things have evolved in this space uh, with many stakeholders uniting in diversity to create something that is most sensical to everybody. Uh, but I, I definitely hear you, uh, Jean-Georges, like I mentioned, is part of this, uh, uh, of this international real-world data collection in Alzheimer's disease working group led by Robert Pernetsky and Frank Jessen in Germany. And so um, we will move forward in, with that in mind in, in that direction. Andy, maybe if you want to, to comment. Yes, you, you mentioned the, um, the precedent of multiple sclerosis. Um, and this is an area where um, a number of new drugs have come up and really disease modifiers. I think everybody now there is a consensus on that, biologicals. And um, it, it's the, uh, there was a, some sort of, not a consortium, but uh, uh, different stakeholders, companies, um, uh, patient advocacies, researchers, etc. Uh, did run a lot of, of research on the disease um, and um, including uh, impact on what you, you were referring to. I mean, uh, burden on, on caregivers uh, uh, and the associated cost, especially the indirect cost, especially as MS uh, does uh, affect uh, young, young people. You know, the emergence of the disease is for younger people. So this is very significant. And progressively, um, evidence was built and more and more evidence about the burden of disease, um, improving quality of life uh, measures as well, um, so that um, uh, it, it became uh, much easier, I would say, or 
uh, more evidence-based to assess the benefits of the new drugs coming one after the other. And it has been an incremental uh, progress. So, the, of course, there are still uh, unmet medical needs, but uh, a lot of progress for, for this disease. Uh, so I think uh, the, the, the position you have now regarding especially early stage of uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease is, is a little bit like uh, it looked like uh, when the first biologicals were introduced for MS. Uh, and this uh, progressive and uh, uh, putting all the stakeholders around the table, and if, even if you do it, if it can be done uh, right now in a, in a really short, uh, I mean, uh, uh, short term, uh, would be very useful to the community and would be a way to, because data will be provided when those products become available, etc. It will, it will, uh, it will be. Uh, a facilitator for payers uh, to 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 take the risk, you know, to to introduce those drugs uh, eventually, uh, even if the cost-effectiveness ratio is not that satisfactory in their eyes. Thank you. You nearly ran the panel. Um, <laughs> that was very good. So, Stefan, just to, just to, I think you've touched upon it, but you also mentioned how complex it is with the clinical trials, sixty something. Um, a set, uh, tools being included. So from your perspective, which factors, if you had to pick some, would be most important to consider to ensure that the future treatments are valued appropriately? And I think that's not for me to say, really. Uh, as, as Angela mentioned, I mean, it's not one type of stakeholder which has to say what's most meaningful. It's really a community that has to come together. And also, um, yeah, it's very complex because, as mentioned again by Angela, for one person it could be something, for another it could be another thing. So there are new tools that are try to address that. What is what matters most to one individual, you know, and to rate that and to follow that in time. But those are new tools not yet adopted by, by payers uh, because they are so new. So I, I think that's also perhaps a, a concern that payers are um, sometimes uh, looking only at uh, very uh, well-established tool, but not necessarily at more innovative means to, to measure, uh, for instance, patient-reported outcomes. But then again, I think the field coming together as one, including with payers and obviously with people with the disease, uh, at early stage of Alzheimer's, you have your judgment, as we have witnessed uh, in the panel earlier today and was very encouraging. So we, we need to uh, come together as a field and agree on what makes sense and then uh, move forward from there. Yes, ju just a comment because when you run a health technology assessment, it's meant to, as you very clearly said, it's, it's to inform a decision, a decision of which will, um, of a collective decision. It means that yes, as a health insurer or universal health coverage system, we will cover uh, such and such intervention. Uh, and of course, it's not at individual level, which is the difference between HTA and evidence-based medicine, because in evidence-based medicine, you have both the scientific evidence, but you have also uh, the, the clinical guidelines and the individual preferences of the patient, which makes a difference. Um, by the way, uh, I just want to, to come back to multiple sclerosis and to, to illustrate how, how much the point of view of, of uh, patients can be important. Uh, I refer to one product which was introduced um, many years ago, actually, um, a biological product, Tizabri. And this product, in, the, in its development, uh, the clinical development was stopped because there was a very severe, almost fatal uh, side effect which appeared in the course of the phase three and the company decided to stop it. And then reconsidering the data, etc., and reconsidering the benefit, the clinical benefit, which was uh, 
coming, you know, uh, becoming quite uh, obvious. Uh, they run again. Uh, they started again the uh, the clinical trial and and went to the end of it. And uh, when it came to the EMA in Europe, um, uh, there was a lot of concern uh, for you know. Um, giving a positive uh, opinion uh, for this product because of this side effect. But it's the patients, European patient advocacy groups, and it was the same story in the US, who came up to the regulatory agencies and they said, well, look, we know there is this side effect. We know it's very, very severe, very fatal, but we also consider that the benefit brought by the product is worth the risk meaning that they have a different perception of the risk-benefit ratio than the one of the regulatory bodies and furthermore of the HDA bodies. And this is so important. Now, the, 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 the good point of the story, and I think we're facing probably the same type of issue uh, when we come with those new uh, early, um, early stage treatments, um, the, the point is that because this product was finally approved, used with a lot of care, but with a lot of data, with data collected, more and more patients were treated, better and better. The identification of the risk factors of patients to have this very severe side uh, effect was known. And then, uh, as long as you build those data, you improve the safety of the utilization of the product. And HTA is also about utilization. How to use properly a product, the right patient, the right moment, and the right, uh, and, and the right target. That's really uh, what we're talking about. Uh, so there are optimistic reference to take on, on board. Thanks. If, if I can just jump in, I mean, that that sounds it sounds like looking at other indications is a really good starting point you know we're, we're on the cusp of a new horizon i guess is what a lot of people are saying for alzheimer's disease and learning lessons from the past is going to be an important thing as we move forwards and I, I just wanted to pick up on something you mentioned there about risk and perceptions of risk uh, and what it made me think of was so last year alzheimer europe founded the european dementia carers working group so that's a working group of people who are carers who have past experience of care for people with dementia this was in the context of a different project. But we asked some questions about uh, trust, transparency, risk, and how they feel about risk in relation to themselves and how they feel about risk in relation to their loved ones that they're caring for. Uh, this was about data sharing, so this isn't directly linked to drug use, but I think the lesson and the, the answers would probably still apply. And what a lot of them said was, well, when it comes to my loved one, the person I'm caring for, I have a much lower threshold for acceptance of risk. So whereas I might say, yes, you know, you can, you can have my health data, I'm willing to share it for X, Y, Z. For them, if they were asked on behalf of their loved one, they would say, well, actually, I'm much more risk averse because I would then feel responsible for anything that happens. And I think we can kind of draw two lessons from that. First of all, that... Um, it tells us that patient reported outcomes are doubly important because they tell us what the patient wants and ultimately they're the ones who will be receiving medication. Um, but also it, we need to be careful about how we phrase these conversations and think about risk in the patient and caregiver context and have the tools that can tease out those individual differences and make sure that individual needs and needs of different groups, because I agree, HTA is not about individuals necessarily, it's about group assessments, how those are taken into account and factored in to these matrices that you use. Marco, any? I mean, I think uh, given the, the, the people with dementia who are addressing the, the audience today, I would say there's a new era coming up mm. of uh, questions asked to patients themselves about quality of life and what is clinical effectiveness means to them. And it will be probably quite different because they don't, they, they, uh, don't will go into cognition as a main area or don't go into uh, risk things or uh, wandering because they want autonomy and uh, going out and more the positive things of keeping uh, still living and doing what you do. 
So I think that the possibility is now to have new outcomes and new surveys, new questionnaires, really addressing the needs and preferences of people with dementia. So that would be a question to all of us, industry and, uh, and patient advocacy groups, to come up with the new kind of outcomes you need to measure in trials. So that's the first thing. And the other thing is that maybe it's worthwhile to, if you go to a HDA approach, that we use a combination of approaches from patient outcome, caregiver outcome, and professional outcome, and blend that together with in a more holistic approach of how can we appraise these kinds of drugs on all, all the levels, so clinical level, but also societal level. Yes, I, I, I clearly from, from the hearing from the patients, and it's not the first time I hear, uh, um, the, the, the capability to, to remain independent, to keep control of his of one's life is really, you know, and, and the, as long as possible, is really what they're looking for, right? Um, and um, which is, it, it's the most important aspect, I think, uh, from, from the testimony from patients. But how can you capture that in uh, an experimental development uh, it's, it's, it's almost impossible because it, you need years, even though you have clinical trials for two years, which is already quite significant, because you are in an environment which is fully controlled to some extent. So um, the only way to, to demonstrate that and to convince payers is uh, to, to, to get real life data in the long term, and this is one of the key challenges you're facing with any treatment for Alzheimer, especially starting early in, 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 the, in the disease evolution. Uh, but there are ways to do that and to get organized to do that, and this is precisely the, the point that it's, 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 uh, which was raised. The, the, the question is that remaining independent, what does it mean? It means, um, and we know that uh, not everybody will be equal. Uh, first, because of the socioeconomic status. Second, because of the education level. Third, because it depends in which country you live, you know, and uh, even in which region you live. And this, these are uh, very complex uh, factors to, to, to put together to, 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 to express it as an outcome. But the more you get patient um, data, larger are the database, the more you can neutralize those environmental and individual factors that may uh, get in the way. And I think this is why it's, it would be so powerful to have those tools to assess the real benefit, real life setting of new treatments before closing the door right away because of budget impact. You can find ways to manage the budget. Now we, now we mentioned payers and HA process quite a few times, but Annie, you can, you can keep the mic, because how do you foresee the key steps involved in evaluating these new treatments for Alzheimer's specifically, and how, does that, how may that potentially differ from other medications? Why is, why is this special? Well, the, the, my first point is that um, if I refer to the frameworks that um, HTA bodies choose to, to, to select, um, there is nothing really specific about Alzheimer, and this is one of the challenges. And Alzheimer disease is in competition with oncology, with you know, other area. Um, uh, this said, um, they, there are adaptation to the different uh, type of, uh, of disease of the framework, and uh, what we we, well, we already discussed about the, the point of the appropriate uh, patient reported outcomes, the appropriate uh, measure of, of, uh, of effect. Um, the first step of uh, HTA is to assess the relative effectiveness versus what is available to treat or not to treat in the absence of specific treatment. Um, but there are uh, alternatives or um, already treatments in place which you know, relates to uh, physiotherapy, uh, etc., which uh, we know they are very useful in, in delaying the, the progression. Uh, so you would compare an innovative product with standard of care. Uh, 
uh, in first uh, from a medical outcome perspective, and this is uh, what uh, HTA where. Uh, agencies can collaborate the, the, the better. Then when you come to economic analysis, it means that you will weight the additional benefits you would expect based on the evidence you have collected versus the extra cost. Uh, and uh, the whole challenge is to uh, assess which benefits are you considering. I would say that for an Alzheimer's uh, uh, disease modifier or product that have a claim of being a disease modifier, uh, it will be a combination of outcome and it, it, uh, efficacy on cognitive impairment because unfortunately is the main driver so far for assessment. Uh, quality of life with the limitations we know uh, the quality of life tools have so far, but it's still, uh, and it is uh, to be considered. Um, and beyond quality of life, um, the years of life where the patient remains at the same stage of evolution, and I think this is very important, uh, and those years of uh, stabilization or even improvement eventually in cognitive, but uh, not stepping from one step to another uh, will be um, adjusted with the quality of life the patients have perceived. This is what the quality uh, refers to. Um, and um, and the, on, the, on the cost, this would be, uh, and of course the safety profile, uh, because uh, you know, uh, there is harm uh, nothing is, no, no medical intervention is harmless, so uh, harm has to be taken into account, I mean side effects, etc. Uh, so this is the medical, uh, this is the outcomes that will be taken into account, and on this side, the cost. And this is where things become complicated, because of course the cost of the product will be the price, at least the price claimed by the company, but it will include also uh, the cost of administration, the root of administration, etc. Uh, it will include the cost of side effects, so all those are direct cost, um, and um, it it would include eventually, uh, if the perspective is uh, the one of the society, it might include the cost also to caregivers. But this is not the case so far in in most of the of the cost effectiveness analysis. Then you find out some sort of ratio. Uh, which is a cost per quality adjusted life years. You can do that only by, um, because you have clinical data up to two years, which is already uh, quite significant. But then uh, if you treat to, to, to delay the progression to the next step, uh, you want to, to anticipate how the, the patients, and it's always statistics, it's not individual patients, uh, will evolve, you know, uh, from one step to another, because this is where the burden will increase, etc. And this is where uh, the extra cost can be compensated. Not only the extra cost, but the extra benefit would. Have it. So to do that, you need to go through some sort of modeling, uh, projecting uh, how, uh, with treatment and without treatment. Uh, how, what are the probability to, to go to one step to another and to each step costs are associated. I mean, this is the way that cost effectiveness is assessed uh, in, in other disease as well, but this is what, what it's done uh, for, um, for um, Alzheimer's disease. But the point is that you can have um, HTA by definition has to be contextualized. It has to to be uh, in line with, it has to be conformed to what is done in the country, in the, in the environment where the product will be used. And this is why it has to be uh, performed, I would say, in each country with the um, existing uh, treatments, cost, the, the relevant cost, etc., and who is paying for what, if you want to have a multi-perspective approach. Um, even discussing the probability to get from one step to another, it can be derived from uh, epidemiological data, uh, but it can be discussed 
you know, because you may have national data which are not in line with the data that were put in the model and so on and so forth. I'm not going into the details, but this is basically the way uh, that it's processed. And at the end of the, you extrapolate lifelong. And at the end, uh, you would say, well, the extra cost uh, per uh, years of life adjusted by quality is that much. And can we afford it or not? And this is where, because uh, it, has, it makes sense when you have constraints resources, which is the case in Europe. We have a large universal health coverage, but the, the, the counterpart is that we have uh, to allocate resources uh, where there is most value. And if the extra cost uh, per quality is too high, uh, some uh, payers or HTA uh, informers would say, no, we cannot have it. Uh, and then we have to find a solution. We have to find a solution. You touched upon some of the challenges associated with why can we not just, you know, implement the holistic assessment, countries will be different. Um, so it's more maybe in some cases a policy why payers cannot include the holistic approach. But how could we work together with these HTA bodies to any or any of you in the panel to get uh, this evaluation process changed? Well, I, I think this, <laughs> this, um, um, this, the point is that HTA bodies, they design their framework, they decide which perspective they would adopt, only the one of the payer, or maybe uh, a larger perspective, the, uh, up to the society, society perspective. Um, but initially, their mission, even though they are supposed to be independent body, they are independent bodies, uh, but they operate uh, in, in our European systems um, uh, along uh, what has been decided at political level. Uh, what has been decided at political level. If you have, uh, and their mission are determined uh, along that line. So um, it means that uh, advocacy, I mean, patient advocacy can have, they have a role an important role to play uh, with HTA bodies, but if they want to be, to be, uh, if they want things to change more rapidly and more extensively, so that those specific aspects of the disease can be taken into account much better, they also have to address at political level the parliament, the members of parliament, the governments, the ministries, and they have to find allies. Uh, in, in the society and uh, caregivers, you know, uh, can, uh, <laughs> are their natural allies, but um, you can have a, a, a communication, etc. Uh, and I think this is uh, under this pressure that uh, the frameworks change. They do change, actually. Uh, quality of life not so far ago uh, was not considered in my country, it was, uh, you know, uh, nice to have, but we don't take it into account. Now, it has to be, it has to be looked at, okay? Um, in Germany, when the uh, initial uh, system for assessing new, new, new medications was put in place in 20, uh, 2011, the law decided that not only clinical relative effectiveness had to be considered, but also quality of life. It's in the law. It is in the law. Um, and in Germany, maybe you are not very happy with the German uh, system, but still, in Germany, the final uh, judgment on all these, you know, assessments, very technical, etc., very, um, uh, the final judgment of whether we, we should have this drug or not, and whether there is a medical benefit or not, uh, is decided by the board of the um, joint, um, the GBA, the joint, uh, oh, I can't remember, joint, joint committee, which decides on what has to be covered by the uh, statutory insurance. And this board do comprise, do comprise representative of patients and other stakeholders, payers um, and, uh, and healthcare professionals. Uh, so the Institution is there. Now, to enforce it further and further, need pressure from patients. 
And patients are more, more powerful if they can put on the table more evidence, more good data. You know, uh, what is the primary uh, expectation they have? This can be uh, probably uh, informed by qualitatively, as it is right now, but maybe it can be further quantified on the large panels of patients, etc. I mean, you know, there are some, uh, they want metrics because they want to be, because they have to be transparent versus the general population on their decisions. So they want metrics to, to say, well, we have hard data, we have good data to, to make a decision and to enlarge our vision of the value. Sorry, I've been... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, please. Maybe, maybe to jump a bit uh, into the future, but I th if, if the EMA uh, decides for conditional approval for the new drugs to come, would that be a situation where we could... Uh, try to find a new framework of ad assessing the real effectiveness of these drugs, bringing in patient outcomes, caregiver outcomes and clinical outcomes together. But then we have to coordinate this kind of conditional approval research data uh, collection. Yeah. And that's, that's a hard job, but that would be the first opportunity to change the perspective of HGA bodies in the future to encompass more patient outcomes and, and caregiver outcomes in their model. But I'm not sure if, if it's a too wild idea. Maybe. No. Too ideal. Too, no, too wild. So is, is, it, is it possible to do this? And what does it mean for us? Um, that, I think that um, the more you are involved into committing to uh, collect uh, produce data, you know, um, support um, uh, improved tools, and um, uh, commit to collect data, uh, and put pressure on the clinicians to collect the data as well, because you need, you know, both sources of information to really, uh, uh, in, in the hypothesis of a conditional approval by EMA, uh, the more uh, this would be... Uh, alleviating <laughs> the burden of HTA bodies because they, they would be a little bit more um, uh, anticipating on, yes, we, we shall have further evidence in a really uh, uh, good way, you know, with good quality data and at a vast, uh, at a vast uh, magnitude. And payers would be more inclined to... to, to to open the door for a first introduction and then, uh, you know, go through some sort of pay for performance agreements or whatever agreements they can have with, with the companies. Uh, but you cannot do that alone. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with almost everything you said, except perhaps to put pressure on the physician, because I think they are already under a tremendous amount of pressure. So I think rather it, it should be important to consider how to make it as easy as possible for them as well. It, it should be easy for everyone, actually. You know, uh, I think we are at a point in time now where technology has evolved so much that it may be possible you know, to have uh, you know, simpler files uh, digitalized that would be owned by the patient themselves. Uh, they could bring them to any physician they would like if they want to move around. Uh, or if they have to, that, that would be possible. And only what's absolutely uh, necessary should be collected, you know, on a systematic basis. There's no need to collect uh, additional data because in the end, it's additional burden for the person that is tested and for the person doing the tests. So that has to be considered. Uh, I think it's uh, the Amsterdam University who showed that uh, the part that uh, patient enjoyed less in their pathway was actually the neuropsychological testing, not even lumbar puncture. You know, it's actually worse torture to do neuropsychological tests than lumbar puncture. So we have to think of ways to make that simpler for them, perhaps do it at home in their own environment, uh, more at ease when they want. Um, involving also the, the loved ones. 
And also considering that, you know, the, we, we have been talking about uh, people with dementia, uh, caregivers, and obviously uh, this is the situation right now, but I, I think, you know, and Jean alluded to this in his opening uh, remarks, blood biomarkers will change that most probably, and so at some point uh, people will know they have the disease at an earlier stage, will be more able to participate uh, in their assessment uh, as well. So, yeah, to, to conclude, I would say we need to capture all of this, but we need to capture that in ways that are not overly complicated and burdensome to everybody. Otherwise, that will fail. What, one short <laughs> reflection, because then we need to move on. Please do, sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan. I think, I think making things easier is generally an ambition everyone should adopt for life. You know, making things easier for other people. Maybe not easier for yourself, but easier for other people. And you mentioned making things easier for clinicians, so it's not burdensome to administer these scales. And also so that participants don't, you know, get really bored when they're doing all these neuropsychological tests. Um, but I think it, this is a systemic issue. So... The challenge, it's a systemic challenge, let's say. Okay, it's a, it's a conundrum that we all need to work together to address. So I think if we can break it down into what each stakeholder needs to do, I don't think you can say, well, this all needs to go back to the patients. The patients have to speak to the HTA and they will, and, and I know that's not what you're saying. Um, I think there is certainly a role for patient organizations, for individual patients, caregivers, other advocates to really explain what meaningful is to them. But I think we can also think about, well, hard data is what's required. So let's think about shaping registries, for example, in, co in consultation with patients, caregivers, HTA, um, healthcare professionals who are going to have to administer these new scales. Let's find some good new scales. I mean, EQ5D, for example, is used now much more commonly than it was, which is great. So we have a quality of life measure that is variably accepted by HTA. Not saying that it's the best, but it's something. So let's use that as a starting point and really try and push it out to as many clinical trials as possible and encourage industry to use and adopt those uh, endpoints because they're important to patients and caregivers and they will be needed in the future. So um, identifying short-term and long-term actions that we can all do collectively, I think will help move the dial and that wasn't very short, so I apologize. Before any, before I need to ask. So now you all seem to agree that registries, um, standardized, or at least consensus around which tools to include would be a good approach. I agree. However, it seems like a more longer term. It's not something you could have tomorrow. What would you? Because now we talk. We also talk about that these things are in the horizon coming up now. So would you? What would you potentially do? to get this more holistic approach to get patients and care partners, you know, implemented now. Marco, what role do you see patient advocacy groups? What could they do to I facilitate think this, this? This is really uh, uh, depending on in, in which country you, you are in. Because uh, last week we got an invitation from our national body to be part of their scoping process. So we are really early on taking on board in this HEA process. But I can imagine that for some other countries, patient uh, groups are overlooked, or just one central patient organization which is asked to do it if for them, and they're not really into our, uh, for instance, they don't know the perspective of people with dementia and so on. So that, that's quite different from every uh, country, I think. But to my colleagues, I would say, uh, try to get hold of this process that's going on and do your best. And it can be uh, reflecting the, the needs and preferences of people you know about this. And try to consult them on your own. So have focus groups of people with dementia and caregivers about what is coming on and try to give that back to the, to the bodies, I think. Is it so? That's the least you can do, to try to get your people, yeah, your, your, the people with dementia and caregivers talk to you about what are their expectations, what are their needs, and what do they think about these new drugs. 
Yeah, and, and in a smooth segue from what Marco just said, uh, and making it all scientific, I would say build the evidence base. You know, we have a role, we, we can do lots of things, I think, as patient advocacy organisations that have in different countries, you know, structures like the European Working Group of People with Dementia. So, you know, we have national uh, bodies or national patient organisations that have these structures. Consult them, get their views, synthesise, collate, build that evidence base and then share it and make sure that, you know, this, the few HTA agencies that don't incorporate public involvement as part of their HTA processes, because a lot more are doing this, you know, changes are coming. Just really make sure that those views and those priorities are, are understood and respected. Thanks, Angela. Just to build on that, to say that right now we do what we can do with what we have, right? I mean, we have the data of the clinical trials and we can build the best models that we can based on that, uh, models that try to make as much sense as possible. But then there's also the commitment to gather data afterwards in clinical practice to get real world evidence to see if the models are fit uh, and work, if they can be improved. But the prerequisite of that is to have you know, there's new, this innovation in the system and that it is accessible at least to a target patient population. And the target patient population should not be too restricted because otherwise you won't be able to study what the treatment does to the broader population, which is, you know, a target population, a restricted population is really a clinical trial. But when you go to the real world, it should be broadened, at least, you know, reasonably so that you can move forward from there. So I think that's where also patients and patient associations have really their voice in explaining that to payers that, you know, if you want to improve from the first step of innovation, the first initial step is access, right? After regulatory approval. Yes, I, I think that in, in this specific situation, um, one of the big, big question is what you just mentioned when we started the panel is uh, how far patients will be ready to undergo, and you mentioned that as well, uh, you know, risk taking, etc. Um, and I think this is one topic which is very important to, to, to address um, because if you are a, a payer, and you look at the figures, you know, about especially MCI early stages, huge figures in theory. Uh, the company may say something else, uh, but really you don't really know. Um, and I think that the fact that um, this would be, I mean, the, 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 the point you say that if we were, if we had a conditional appro approval, but you, I mean, there might not be reason to make it conditional at regulatory level. Uh, but the fact that um, the um, uh, patient um, our advocacy groups are ready to collaborate from the very start, the launch of the product, etc., uh, of the products, and to collect data, etc., uh, would be uh, very helpful uh, also to identify um, what would be the the patient perspective in in you know uh, in expecting the, the treatments uh, because it's a big question mark actually and it 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 it's it's uh, budget so, impact no 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 <laughs> <laughs> sorry I need, no, just I, I was wanted to to comment on the risk taking part you know there there's few setting. Uh, besides clinical trial in which you can have as much explanation about the risk that you're undertaking, you know? And in clinical trials, many of the risks uh, are well known, you know, uh, since already several years ago, uh, even a decade. And still the percentage of patients and their care partner uh, refusing to enter a clinical trial because of this risk is minimal. You know, it's a single digit percent so I think we already have kind of a proxy of uh, this risk taking for, from patients. But, uh, another point uh, which is supposed to be in the range of uh, HTA uh, assessment, I mean health technology assessment, is um, how, um, 
how um, patients will have access from a medical perspective. And this is, uh, and how the new, uh, the innovation will disseminate across the, 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 the population and so on and so forth. And in this precise case, we know that there are uh, lots of issues related to biomarkers, uh, assessment, etc., uh, in terms of resources available. Uh, and it's probably across all Europe, actually. Um, so, um, I mean, this is also part of the story that you, you I mean, the patient, if they really want, if, the, if, you, if there is significant <laughs> uh, an ob object Object, I would say, uh, measured uh, aspiration to have access to these treatments uh, in a country, uh, it also could drive more preparation, prepar preparation of the healthcare systems, you know, and this, it would be helpful, actually, uh, to the decision makers to have this kind of information also for that respect. Great. The final, quick final. <laughs> Um, I have something hot off the press or just something that came out of a consultation we, we did this morning with, with the European Working Group. And we were talking about anti-amyloid therapies, you know, the things in the headlines. And um, one of the questions that um, Anna, my amazing colleague, who, who's the public involvement lead, um, brought up was, well, we have lots of ambitions. We've got lots of asks. We want access. We want a timely diagnosis. We want more specialists. We want to be able to see our healthcare professionals when we need to see them and when we want to see them, not just you know, at an arbitrary time. What can we do tomorrow? And the number one thing they asked for was clear, transparent, timely, accurate communication of benefit, but also of risk. Um, with the understanding that there is a certain degree of acceptance. You know, you'll take the risk, um, or you might make an individual decision to take the risk, but you need all the information in order to make an informed decision. So I think that's something that we can do, we, you know, the collective we, can do tomorrow. Transparent, clear, accurate, truthful communications. Great, thank you. Final, final, final. <laughs> no, I, I think that's uh, obvious that we need to do that, but we also need to acknowledge the uncertainty yeah. when with innovation. Yeah. Okay. That's what I wanted to say. All right. Thank you. So, in summary, and please, I will give you the microphone back in a second, but in summary, from if I have to try, some of the advices are engage with local payers and regulators, what evidence is needed, substantiate the position with data, build some evidence base in some shape or form now, while in parallel for the longer term, work on the registries, consensus on tools, standardized um, clinical trials. Do you have any with the remaining five-ish minutes, four, maybe one for each, do you, what is your final reflection and or encouragement to the audience today? Marco. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm positive about the idea of a, a more, a more registries to come in and then harmonize what we learn from these registries together with clinicians, patients and, and advocacy groups and also research community, that would be worthwhile for me. And the other thing, um, I'm not sure. I think what we keep in mind is that these new drugs are the first one to come, but we need to think about other drugs to come in, a, in another way. So maybe the administration of the drugs will change within five years. So be aware of that and don't invest now money in things that you will need to de-invest in four or five years. So that would be an idea. Yeah. Um, so continuing along the same theme, I think we are at a un in a unique situation at the moment because people are now constructively trying to th come together and address problems that have existed for decades. You know, these aren't new issues. Lack of healthcare systems capacity is not a new thing. But at the moment, there seems to be a lot of momentum and will to really do something about it. 
And I think that should benefit people, not only within the fairly narrow indication for these new anti-amyloid therapies, but also the broader dementia community. And I'm being broad here, not just Alzheimer's, vascular, all the other sources of, uh, that lead to dementia, because they will also benefit from the changes that are coming. I think that provided uh, those um, uh, new products we're talking about uh, are, are approved in Europe, it's, it's a unique opportunity to, to, to raise the standards uh, in terms of uh, share of voice for uh, dementia people, uh, in terms of um, uh, adaptation of the healthcare systems to, to better take care of them. Uh, and uh, I think that um, you should not miss it because um, I was involved in the, in the introduction of the previous um, drugs um, I, I received and I should not mention the, the trade, I can't remember the um, Memantine, etc. And I must say that uh, there was a lot of disappointment uh, from these drugs. So there is a huge, I mean, there is a consensus that a new approach is really needed. Uh, and maybe the story will, will be uh, along years, you know. Um, my, my vision, but it's, it's, uh, it's, I'm not a, a scientific person, but what I guess is that uh, in 10 years, maybe we shall have uh, the need for combinations of drugs meaning that there would be successive incremental progress made uh, requiring, you know, combination or whatever because you're targeting different uh, aspects of the disease and so on and so forth, so that it would be really uh, a shame not to uh, benefit this opportunity of the introductions of really innovative uh, products to, to pave the way to to uh, you know, a uh, much more uh, improved uh, care uh, of of of, uh, of this disease, terrible disease. Thank you. So, I think you mentioned the interplay between uh, HTA bodies and policymakers, but I think who influence the policymakers is in fact you and you and me and everybody, you know, their constituents. So I think it's high time to raise the, our collective voice to make, uh, you know, Alzheimer a top priority as it is and it should be because our brain health is our most precious treasure, what makes us who we are. And I, I want to hear more uh, panels like the one uh, we had earlier today with people, you know, really explaining uh, what it means for them to have the disease and what they want. And I hope these same people can uh, be heard also by HTA bodies, policymakers in the future, uh, having a clear understanding of the evolution of the field, which is not easy because this field is evolving super fast. And so I hope that everybody is going to be on the same page and able to grasp uh, the tremendous opportunity that lies ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much for participating and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>